Please be seated. Chancellors, deans, heads of department, students, family and friends of Professor Odemagil, I am advised that his son from Norway is here, as is his son from Zambia, and the third one from Cape Town. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, his two sisters are also here, <laughs> as is his daughter in law. I just want to extend a very, very special welcome to Rob's family. Mulweni Kuyeland, good evening. A very warm welcome to Professor Robert Donahue's professorial inaugural lecture. Our university calendar lists all current full professors of Rhodes University. Included in this year's calendar is the name of Professor Robert Donahue, the director of the Environmental Learning Research Center. This evening, as is our tradition, we have the presentation of the inaugural lecture that follows the university conferring the status of full professor on an academic. An inaugural lecture is an occasion of great significance in one's academic career. It is an occasion in which we as academic peers, colleagues, students, family, friends, and the public celebrate the intellectual and scholarly achievements of one of our professors. If you had guessed, based on his surname, or Donahue, that Rob might have some links with Ireland, <laughs> you would be right. <laughs> he was born in Ireland, and moved to Africa at a young age, where he completed his schooling in Harare, Zimbabwe. It was in Zimbabwe where he and his wife, Kami, qualified as teachers, Trubulawayo Teachers, Teachers College, and the University of Zimbabwe. Robin Kami both taught in primary schools in Gweru for a few years before moving to Peter Marinsberg where they taught at St. Charles College. Rob and Carmen have three sons. Two of them are proud graduates of this fine institution. <laughs> After seven years as primary school teacher, I was invited to interview for the post of Environmental Education Coordinator at KZN White Life. He joined us in Velo KZN Wildlife, where he coordinated environmental education services and research as senior profes professional officer, supporting activities in park, school, and local community settings for just under 20 years. During this time, his work on active learning expanded into citizen science, where catchment action toolkits were refined by Jim Taylor and Mark Graham into Minister's program that we have today. To resource expanding environmental education initiatives, Rob and his team started ShareNet, an open access, <coughs> low cost publishing initiative run through WESA. One of his roles was coordinating the development of materials for environmental education field. Materials developed with teachers and natural scientists included Action Ecology Service with M. Toad, 
Environment Picture Building with Michelle Strong, Enviro Facts with Linda Petston, and numerous hands-on field guides for the coastal and inland habitats of eastern and southern Africa. In a review of Shannet over a three-year period between 2011 and 2013, 92,610 field guides, booklets, and resource packs had been produced and sold by WESA. Shannet was thus a key initiative for getting the tools for environmental education out to teachers, children, and community groups in Southern Africa. Alongside Shannet, Green Schools was started with Kevin Birch of the then Natal Education <coughs> Department. Rob was part of the group who developed the School Environmental Policy Act with Kim Ward. This became the foundation of the Eco Schools project that was initiated with Dr. Jim Taylor of Wesson. Rob com completed an MA degree at the University of Natal on participatory curriculum development in the sciences in 1990, which he attained with a distinction. <coughs> he followed this with a PhD at Rhodes on the emergence of environmental education in Eastern Southern Africa in 1997. <coughs> he was appointed at Associate Professor level as director of the Goldfields Environmental Education Service Center at Rhodes University in, 20, sorry, in 2001 to work with Professor Halalot Sisitka in the Environmental Education Unit, an environmental education program initiated by Professor Pat Irwin and Dr. Ureta Rosenberg near Yamse from Lansberg. The program was initially externally funded by Goldfields and Marianne Roberts and was taken up into Rhodes University to become the Environmental Learning Research Center that we have in the Education Department today. He will shortly be a professor in the Environmental Learning Research Center and he is also the director of this center where he has worked for just under 15 years. As a member of the Education Department, Rob teaches modules on the PGCE course with uh, Lisa Westerway, the B.Ed. Honors led by Luzan Ovid, and the M.Ed. Environmental Education Program led by Dr. Ingrid Shudom, as well as supervising PhD research. His academic position allowed Rob to extend his early work on an expanded model of the environmental, of the environment that included biophysical, social, economic, and political dimensions. Coupled with this, an important focus area was the framing of active learning. This work was initially developed around an open process framework of dialogue, encounter, and reflection that was later developed in a text on outcomes-based education and was recently revised for the current CAPS. These heuristic tools provide key orient orientating perspectives for, environmental, for environment and sustainability education in Southern Africa and are informing teacher professional development through the Fundisa for Change initiative that is led by Ingrid Shudo and Zintle Sonoma. Rob has published numerous peer-reviewed papers and book chapters in international publications, where he has given attention to the concept of environmental education, education for sustainable development, transformative pedagogy, and co-engaged curriculum change. More recently, he has given close attention to indigenous knowledge practices, social theory, and environmental learning in post-colonial curriculum and community contexts. During his time at Rhodes, Rob has given close attention to the emerging concept of environmental education and education for sustainable development. 
In 2014, this body of work led him to being invited to convene a workshop on the concept of an environmentally sustainable development at the World Congress at Nagoya, Japan, to conclude the UN decade and map out the current global action program. This work with the Japanese Research Institute clarified ESD as an ethics-led process of reflexive social learning. His work on the intermeshed biophysical, social, economic, and political dimensions of environment, environmental education, as an evaluative <coughs> process and active learning are key orientating perspectives within environment and sustainability education in Southern Africa today. Recent work on indigenous knowledge includes research links with Norway, Mexico, and India. His work on transformative social learning is informing teacher professional development. This is true for this for change program. It also informs citizen science and reflexive social learning in UNESCO regional centers of expertise in education for sustainable development. And biosphere reserve context of learner-led change towards more sustainable earth stewardship. He has developed an evaluation toolkit for select regional centers of expertise in education for sustainable development, and supports the Makana and Rural Eastern Cape RCE at Rhodes University. There are 120 similar centers worldwide, coordinated by the United Nations Educate, United Nations Universities Institute for Advanced Studies. Rob <coughs> is certainly very varied. And upon trying to explain his work to his granddaughter, Rachel, he explained that most of grandpa's work these days is trying to help people. She apparently approves of his work. <laughs> <laughs> and we certainly do too. <laughs> it is now my great pleasure to invite Professor Robert Donaghy to present his professorial inaugural lecture titled Engaging the Contemporary Challenge of Rethinking Education Abroad. I probably don't need the uh, microphone, but in case my voice fails, Probably should have that better. Yeah. Um, thanks very much, Dr. Mogazela. Um, it's a real honor to be here today. Um, I was a late starter, and I've been quite challenged to um, put together uh, something that was contemporary, and Professor Nell, one of my early advisors, said, whatever you do, if, if you're doing an inaugural at any time, choose something contemporary and treat it seriously. Don't become too involved in your career. So I'm going to leave my career to itself, and I really thank you, Dr. Mabizella, for spelling out the contours of it. It's um, very nice to hear it um, said by someone else and not to feel the struggle that it's taken. Um, and I chose this topic because we are right in the middle of this process here and it's not only us that are struggling but universities all over the world, the modern university is seriously looking at this challenge of rethinking education um, and trying to get traction on it it was fortunate that the United Nations, uh, well, UNESCO produced this um, document. And it's very clear that the elements that we treasure in education, like knowing the knowledge component and the skills component, have been exemplified. But what's happened is they have been much more located back in the world. And learning to be, to become a citizen, to develop an identity as a person with autonomy and judgment, 
is also exemplified, as is living together. And all of these are treasured and roads. So it was, from this standpoint, I thought, well, I'm making a, a good start. But how do I start to actually engage with this contemporary issue? And I could only do it from the co-engaged vantage point of the Environment and Sustainability Education Center on the margins. And I particularly chose this notion on the margins because if one looks at any change, it often starts on the margins. And then it takes up from there. And it's always a challenging um, project to be involved in. So um, then the sort of seriousness of the topic hit home. And I thought I must be able to shed some light on the current failures in communication, empathy, and trust that are latent when one is facing this challenge of engaging these contemporary rethinking processes because they can't be done by us alone. They have to be done in the company of others. And I thought, well, if we have, don't have communication, empathy, and trust, where do we start? And how does one start approaching a topic of this magnitude at these times that it's very important for us to give attention seriously to the issue of change? So. Looking back on the growing specialist field of environment and sustainability, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up on some of the work that Dr. Mabizello already alluded to around the concept of environment, the overtaking of ecological idealism in our work, the work on active learning, and some of the new tools that we're developing for um, the sustainable development goals around future sustainability. That looking back process came into stark relief when I thought, well, I also need to look around. And it was in the looking around that the existing um, systemic conventions that one is constantly trying to work with came into stark relief. That is the critical location on the margins. Comfortable and frustrating. The collaborative challenge that one has in a system and here I started to find that we're working island style at the moment, and how can we change this island style work in the academy? <coughs> I looked at the inclusion, particularly the inclusion of indigenous knowledge. I was always a very reluctant supervisor of indigenous knowledge, but it's been some of the most rewarding work on education that I've been involved with. Then the notion of reorientation of the curriculum, and the work at Rhodes is already spilling out into a collaboration with other universities around the country. So that's a relatively easy one with a lot of lessons on transformation and change that we can learn from the partnerships with other universities. And finally, the expansion of civic engagement in the Amanzi for Food project, which is also just an example of the expansive civic engagement. And all of these dimensions, looking back and looking around, are part of the rethinking of education that we need to engage ourselves in. And when I come out rethinking education, I came out with this notion of an African Futures Challenge. This African Futures Challenge building on the strengths and the strategic transitions that we can make in our university, as well as the deliberative practice that's necessary for going forward. So that's the framework of what I'm going to explore, and I, I hope that I'm going to be able to do it in a reasonably coherent way. Now, the startup question was, how is it that university knowledge and practices for enhancing orientation in the world have been accompanied by recent failures? And we're talking about real stark failures in communication, empathy, and trust. They have really been latent. And how do we begin to understand these? Now, my attempt was, to go to Homo Academicus or Pierre Bourdieu and look at you know, what is it that's been happening in the universities. And on habitus and social orientation, what he does in his work on the reproduction of social life, he gives attention to what people do. And in the university, if we're able to look at what we do in relation to the doings in the world that are necessary for future sustainability, then we are probably on the right track. Now, what he notes here is that each agent, wittingly and unwittingly, willy-nilly, is a producer and a reproducer of objective meaning. 
because his actions and his works are the product of a modus operandi of which he is not the producer and has no conscious mastery. Because we mustn't think of it in terms of the ontology of us as people and our sense of mastery, but that mastery in the institutional setting and how elusive that mastery can be. Because the students are not just listening and learning from us, they're listening and learning in the institution, and the institution is in a social space of conflict. So that this conscious mastery is very elusive, and although we've got an objective intention, as the scholastics put it, which always outruns conscious intentions, and this was the important point that I've highlighted here, is that what features of education practice in the modern university are outrunning my intentions um, when these are read against those of many of the students? So how are the intentions being outrun in this process of change? Um, now, on insight of this, I had to really start to go back into the, into the long term, and some of my colleagues will be waiting for when is he going to make reference to Norbert Elias? You see? <laughs> <laughs> well, here it comes now. Um, because um, Norbert Elias' work on the symbol theory, he, he specifies that um, if the symbols of a language were not to some extent congruent with reality, with the data they represent, humans could not survive. Pretty obvious. All right? But here's the point, that their orientation would be flawed and their communication full of misunderstandings. So we need to look back at the intellectual project from the Enlightenment and say, how has the intellectual project from the Enlightenment produced the modern university of today? Because the Enlightenment project, there was this great proliferation of knowledge of orientation. And the knowledge of orientation is in the universities today, in these fragmented specialist fields, that are being more and more fragmented and have been for a long time. Now, Elias points out that one of the consequences of the depth of knowledge that we are having in the modern world and the specialist fragmentation is communication failure. And the balance between orientation knowledge and communicative knowledge is a really important balance that we need to seriously look at if we're looking at the knowledge in the university today. Well, if we do look at that, much of current human orientation is clearly flawed. Okay, we're not very successful on a sustainability. We're not very successful on the social. We're not very successful on the political, on social justice. So we're clearly flawed in terms of orientation. What about on the communication front? Well, our present communication on questions of transformation and sustainability is not always reflect this shared understanding of trust, as I explained a little bit earlier. So what happens is the conditions that have been produced since the Enlightenment and the modern university is in trouble. And it's not just a problem that's arising here in South Africa, here at Rhodes University, through all sorts of um, initiatives that are taken to force change, but it's a problem for humanity as a whole. And that's how I found myself um, approaching it. And when we take this into the academy and we're looking at the deliberative reorientation of things, change, making change in the academy, it's not easily navigated at all, as many of us have been involved in these processes. Um, deliberative reorientation can be inhibited by systemic cultures themselves especially when these are tilted towards fragmented disciplinary um, specialisms in the modern university, as I've explained. And here one commonly finds political sociologies, to borrow from Popkowitz, of transformative deliberation that are often divergent, contested, and fragile. When I originally wrote this, I said brittle. They break very easily. You know? And Garland said, no, fragile will be a little bit better than brittle. Okay. <laughs> Imperative to disrupt the persistent effects of colonial and modernist sort of marginalization can also be exclusionary, fragile, and volatile. So these two in the mix are a real challenge. And the mix makes rethinking and transforming education a fractured, high-stakes game, as we are seeing, that is characterized by abjection, 
Abjection is the term used by Popkowitz in, in um, his Cosmopolitanism, where he says even in the co cosmopolitan state, there are these blind exclusions. There are these bases, these places that people won't go. There are transitions that become very difficult to actually make. And abjection with fluid, indeterminate imperatives, things that keep on moving, the goalposts goal keep on moving, and they're very strongly held, and they're emotionally deeply felt. So one can understand that these challenges um, are really in your face quite often, as many of the senior executives have, have experienced, and many of the students have experienced as they walk around in terms of the rape crisis that we've just had. It was in their faces. They needed to express these ideas. So here it's possible um, for sustained open engagement. I'm still the optimist. Um, to constitute new spaces for co-engaged social innovation. And that's what I'm going to try to exemplify out of the data that I'm going to examine here with you tonight. So I had to find an African framework um, which has, or a framework that has been recently taken up in the post-colonial arena to be able to articulate this process for myself. So the alienated engagement in search of an expansive third space is where I started to look. This co-engaged spaces of social innovation that comes from the work of Homi Baba and many of the scholars, the post-colonial scholars who picked up on that work. So if you take a complex constellation of social ecological risk, and there we are living and doing and knowing things together, then when we start looking for change, the heritage practices of looking back to bring these into critical focus of the present can actually be something that is abjected or something that is embraced. Anything can happen. Many of the scholars working on the indigenous knowledge process have found inspiration and traction by taking this route. Similarly, you can get abjection of the modern expert culture in society, or you can get um, perspectives that actually can contribute to clarity and direction. And with some looking across and some critical discourse, you can start to bring, in, to begin, um, to bring learning innovations. But increasingly, there's a complete rejection of these phenomena. There's a complete rejection and a wish to start over. And that's really interesting. Because it almost exemplifies the falsification in science of the methodologies of science. Scientists have always believed that they've had this objective approach to developing knowledge. But if you read Roy, Roy Bastard's work, he shows how in the scientific method, you can't take away the person. And the person smuggles the ontology in to the objective method, okay? Whether you like it or not. But the detour process and the power of the scientific inquiry <coughs> is what is really important. And here, even when there is rejection, one always gets some sort of bringing out of who you are and where you came from. Some sort of bringing <coughs> in of who you are and how you lived so that there's a bringing together of ideas. These kinds of processes are really important for third spaces to bring about freedoms and to produce change. And this is one of the areas that I use to structure this. So I'm going to do a bringing out process, I'm going to do a bringing in process, and I'm going to try to pull the whole thing together. And my computer tells me it's seven o'clock. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I should teach that <laughs> That was a good opportune time for you to intervene. Um, so looking back at the early concept of the environment, it was really interesting to reflect that the Arcadian foundations of the early wildlife ecology shaped environmental education as nature study. Okay? Looking at interdependence of living things, looking at awareness and human impact, and also looking at future sustainability. And here, the environment was about natural ecosystems under threat from people. And when we threw this model, well, I, I threw this model, and I was provoked by Pat Irwin, you know, at the time. Pat can be quite a provocative person. And he said to me, Rob, just, just write it down as you think it should be, as a geographer, you know. He says, I can agree with it. And I said, Pat, how many other people are going to agree with it? And it was a real 
challenge in its time, because right in the middle of the 80s, when you started talking about the political, the social, and the economic as an environment concerns, it was a real challenge. And um, I went and shared with Pat a concern that um, when I was working in the Soweto Science Center, um, I was approached and they said, you know, Rob, what are you up to? The security police are asking questions about you. And I said, what? You know, this is something that was completely out of my experience. I had no experience of these kinds of things at all. And, you know, my bosses said, well, you know, um, you need to do what you think is best. And um, in, when these controversies occurred in my life at three or four times, I always had institutional support. So it's very important in a situation of change to actually get support. Because our students need support. They're doing something that is significant to them. They don't need our criticism. They need our support. And in difficult times like this, I really did appreciate the, the, the um, support. So when you take a concern and you pop it in there, then people started to see the sense. And we were able to develop our theories around the um, open processes of a triad of controls of Elias and the idea that basic human survival depends on adjustments in the ecological conditions. Mm -hmm. But adjustments in the ecological conditions are linked to adjustments in the social conditions, in the economic conditions, and in the political conditions. So we were engaged in a new game. And that new game is what I came to play at Rhodes. And Rhodes was able to cope with that game. Rhodes came out of a struggle history, and Rhodes had credentials. Okay, These credentials were in the stock, in the structures, that people were able to take up the social concerns of the time and do something significant. And it was really important when I joined in that struggle with people of the likes of um, Eureta and Hala, who had provided such leadership in this field of environment and sustainability. So in moving beyond the Arcadian, you know, um, I'm now kind of like exempting, exemplifying the seriousness of it. But if you take the way that we worked with children and all of the material that we produced, some stuff went like this. You know, what happens when it rains and people are not looking after the land? We get the water going all dirty. If the water goes dirty, then the fish can't see their food. And if the fish can't see their food, then the people who eat the fish the kingfishers, they can't see their food. But also, the sunshine doesn't shine through. And if the sunshine doesn't shine, whoops, what's happening there? Okay? <laughs> and then, whoops, what else is happening? Okay? So that this kind of thinking is really important to be able to see and to be working with children. So no one's working with the seriousness of the human condition, one's also working with children. And if you're working with Zulu children, as I was at the time, then there's a great need for song. And so we developed a song, okay? And the song was, it, it goes like this. <coughs> <laughs> no, I was hoping I wasn't going to do this. <laughs> we are looking for the pattern in nature, searching for the pattern in nature, trying to find the pattern that connects us in this world of ours. Try it, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we are looking for the pattern in nature, searching for the pattern in nature, trying to find the pattern that connects us in this world of ours. Oh no, we've got a destination. Now we need a new direction. We're searching for a reconnection in this world of us. So, this is what's so exciting about the work that we do. You know, the demands, the variety, the engagement, the possibilities, the educational oeuvre that is being created. And here... <laughs> A long time ago. <laughs> the sociocultural articulation into active learning and theorizing our space really needed closer attention. So we started to work on active learning. 
And here is a sort of like a decades of work in just a picture. Because when we were looking for the pattern in nature, what was really important was the encounter, taking children into nature to see things, and then to actually dialogue, to talk about it, to build knowledge together, and then to reflect on what it means. And it became very clear to us that a socio-cultural approach was essential for the environmental work that we were doing. And here, one needed the Vygotskyan theories, and you needed the notion that knowledge comes to us from others ultimately. Okay, it has come from us, from others. And then we make it our own. So how can we get that right blend of active learning processes that allow the meaning-making processes to occur? And here, experiential meaning-making and expansive learning through processes of re-semitization are what we are opening up. And we're working with quite a variety of frameworks for active engagement in learning at the moment. And this notion of co-engaged, reflexive social learning, and this exploratory change practices produced revolutions in our own field from within. And one of the most exciting ones that we had here at Rhodes was the act of learning as a situated process of learning-led social transformation in the practical arena of doing something. And this came from a little child in India around the idea of if the world's in trouble, we can fix it by doing something with our hands. We don't need to worry about the problems. And a proliferation of activities occurred at our center. And it was a very exciting space, and our center is a very exciting place in the education department to be and to learn together. And things move on. They're moving on very fast at the moment, and we're moving from the Millennium Development Goals into the Sustainable Development Goals, and we're looking at a much bigger agenda. The new nexus is the sustainability concerns. And quality Education, Sustainable Development Goal 4, and partnerships are the two things that are exemplified in our work. And if you look at what we've got to deal with, it actually suddenly is all of us. It's not a little center of a few academics exploring things. Poverty, hunger, good health and well-being, gender equity, um, the reducing of inequalities, peace and justice, clean water and energy, <clears throat> climate action, resilient life below water and on land, decent work, <coughs> economic growth, sustainable cities, responsible production and consumption. That is the agenda. That is the agenda that we have for actually rethinking education. And beginning to work with it is quite mind-boggling. You know, we're not just a little nature study group at the side anymore, as we used to be. But we're actually joining hands with people all over the world. And I was in um, Mexico and in uh, Sweden recently in the last uh, four or five weeks. And three of the colleges, well, three of the universities that I went up with, um, education departments, they have adopted this as the ethos of their Department of Education, as the foundation for all of the education um, recurriculating work that they do. And I was working with them with this simple tool uh, around the idea, of if we start with the notion of a healthy socio-ecological context, then poverty, hunger come to the fore and have to be dealt with. Then if we're going to be ethical and if we're going to be fair, then gender equity, and reducing inequality and peace and justice come to the agenda. If we're going to be wanting to use our life giving resources with care, then all of the biodiversity concerns come to the agenda. And if we're going to be want to developing pathways for sustainability that are peaceful, just, and safe, then we have really got a task on our hand that needs a reframing of the education project into the future. So, now the reality bites, as I look about. Here we are in our little center, and we're located as the ELRC on the side. And it was a real sobering thought to say, you know, we think our work is so important, but every institute at Rhodes thinks their work is so important. And we've got lots of sideshows, but we aren't really able to join hands we work island style. 
Now, how can we actually enable the work to, um, how can a specialist center on the periphery best function within a modern university system? And what are the university systems doing for enabling the cross-university engagement to take place? Collaboration is a very difficult thing. Mechanism for cross-faculty knowledge articulation and research on learning-led change and future <coughs> sustainability are emerging in the modern universities worldwide. What can we learn from them? And what can we do here at home in terms of enabling these? The modern university system has, is an individualizing process of academic recognition that makes it difficult to sustain collaborative research across structures. And one, it's hard to transgress the traditional disciplinary conventions. So one ends up with this dialectic. How do we break away? Could not be, how do we do both? How do we actually maintain the current disciplinary excellence and foster the cross-hatching at the same time? And these transdisciplinary research processes are starting to raise their heads. They're starting to support collaborative thematic work. And these are starting to inform future sustainability. How can these be supported to actually grow in our university was the question. And how can we have an expansive inclusion? <clears throat> this is also not a very easy matter. And the inclusion of indigenous knowledge in the work that I've been involved with has been a long process but extremely rewarding. For years, students badgered me to support education and research in relation to the inclusion of indigenous knowledge. I was always very resistant. I said, look, I'm not indigenous. Okay? And I said, how are we going to actually do that? And then I said, well, I am indigenous, actually, if I think about it, because I'm also on this planet, along with you. You know? So we are indigenous together, but the discourse doesn't allow that. So how did I work as a detribalized Irishman, okay, living in Africa, and I'm not going back to that weird cold country, okay? And so what I started to do is I started to actually understand the Irish indigenous knowledge, some of the cultural history and some of the heritage. And then I'd come and teach that, and that was a resonance for African scholars to be able to say, okay, so we've got this and we've got that. So I was never bringing anything to indigenous knowledge. And all the indigenous knowledge was just coming to me, and I was being enriched by the insights of African scholars. And that was probably some of the most rewarding academic work. But the current discourses don't allow that very much. And um, what we are trying to do now is we're trying to open up new approaches. And I've just come back from uh, Mexico where they're doing some fascinating intercultural work. And one of our past scholars, who's at UNISA now, Sol Shaba and I, are working with scholars there in India and also in Scandinavia amongst the Sami people above the Arctic Circle. And it's really interesting to see the way the indigenous peoples okay, are able to be in conversation. And the tendency to exclude the other by objection is now increasingly falling away and is becoming this intercultural process. So if you look at some of the tools that we're developing with critical realism, and is Gladys Chacha here, Gladys there? She is making us some cheo for tonight, um, so you can actually taste some and it can um, uh, prepare you for the food that you're going to receive when we have a little party afterwards. Here are certain practices for producing good amacheo. Now I can tell you many stories that I've been told about this, but we haven't got time for it tonight. And in the school curriculum, we've got all of the science related to fermentation. And what we've been studying is how do the two talk to each other and mutually enrich each other. And I think it's the mutual enrichment through working with Pascal's work on these processes of knowledge production um, that we're able to now find meeting points rather than discordance and disjunctures in a lot of the work that has been the characteristic of the colonial oppression and exclusion of much of the richness in indigenous knowledge. Um, curriculum reorientation, I already mentioned very briefly, and the beginnings of this wider curriculum deliberation at Rhodes, the academic research of Carl Mouton, or Carl Mason rather, and his um, semantic density, gravity, and waves, is 
really important, but it's mostly directed at the academic project. Out of the Fundisa for Change, we're also getting a much wider concern, more in the semiotics of cultural location. So what we can do is probably in Africa, when we're working with this groundbreaking work, we can probably add new dimensions to this research. And the practical work that is happening with Zintle, Ingrid, Serka, Lebona, and Hela is really significant in this, in this area. And here the work of Anne Edwards is enabling us to broaden this intermeshing um, and to look at the wider um, uh, task sequencing processes that are involved in learning interactions. So that what one gets is the acquisition for participation and one also gets the reflexivity that comes with acquired knowledge enabling participation. And here what you get is you get the teacher teaching, you get the learners doing things, and then you get the magic of the learners getting on and doing things in their own way. As long, and, and then you've got the assessment processes. Now, I built it up in that way, but when you look at it, where do you start? You can start anywhere. Where do you go? Often the learners will take you in different directions. You can go in circles, you can go across, and it's the ability to find starting points that are relevant for the students, and then let the students lead, that seems to be really important in a lot of the Fundisa for Change. And the teachers are appreciating this because they're able to teach, but then they're also able to follow where the learners lead and engage with the learners. Finally, in the last look around, the expansion of civic engagement, the emphasis on co-engagement work in, and this hopefully transdisciplinary shift that we might see in much of our work. This needs to be given really close attention in our curriculum work because we seem to have this element of, okay, well, you're an individual now, you're in the learning center, you're a director there, which I'm not sure what that is, but um, <laughs> they, they kind of like do their own thing. They certainly don't take any direction from me, but maybe the processes of finding direction together work a lot better. When we're in trouble, we just ask Hayla. <laughs> but I think there's a lot to be said for rethinking the idea of you've got these three things to do. And in the Environmental Learning Research Center, we're not very good at maths, okay? I'm particularly bad at maths, and I'm particularly terrible at administration and any numbers. Okay, so I can get to one thing, and I'm quite single-minded in many of the things that I do. When it comes to two, I start getting puzzled. When it gets three, I'm really lost. So we tend to kind of do our teaching in an engaged, community-orientated way, okay, so that we're building the academic project and the research project and the community engaged project in an integrated sense. And the Amanzi for food, here you start seeing, and I picked this out because you start seeing some of these um, important integrations. Here is the indigenous knowledge coming in, in this work. And look at the way it just sort of like pops up all over the place. And then what you've got is the practical hands-on, the handprints for change work that is there. And then you've got the knowledge work in the agricultural sector. And you have got the science that is associated with these. So when you're in the world, you're drawing on the multiplicity. And I think that has been one of the exciting things about working in the center. So rethinking education to try to begin to pull some threads together. What will it take for us to enhance our character as an African university in co-engaged, deliberative engagement in third space innovations for future sustainability? In our residences, in our academic programs, in our community, community engagement practices. What will it take? Have we got reasons for optimism? Well, I've never lost that optimism. But one of the difficulties that I've had is when we've brought these simple ideas and the problems in the world to our students, they can't agree. There's this constant argumentation. And I've tried it on a number of occasions in lessons. And we don't seem to be able to get beyond the argumentation. And then along came this um, John Holmberg, 
And he said, look, one of the key things, if you're dealing with complex systems and if you're dealing with complex processes, one of the key things is to start looking at what is possible and start looking at pathways to future sustainability. Not how to get there, but where you want to be and the steps that are necessary to produce what you want to be. And here, I've been working with this now for, it's been about a couple of months, I think, where we looked at these future sustainability pr principles. Top is people's dignity and meeting their basic needs. To me. I reverse the whole order of these things. And it's really interesting. Then you're able to say, well, can we stop the natural degradation of the systems? Can we actually stop concentrations that are accumulating in the atmosphere out of the Earth's crust? And can we, for heaven's sake, stop producing things that just stay there forever in the planet and accumulate and cause all sorts of problems? So, what future states of dignity, equity, care, and ways of doing things can we imagine as being desirable and being possible? Can we put them up there? Now, when I changed this and I used this approach with the students, what was amazing is they were able to agree. They were able to kind of like meet that challenge, big as it is, and they were able to agree. So when you try to get everything sorted out in one go, you need to agree on some things that are going to take the process forward. Then you can start saying, okay, how are we going to get there? What do we need to do? The second last approach that I'm going to take is go right back to this. Because it was this process that Holmberg starts to build on. And he said, what characteristics, what characterizes the good life and the good society and the well-being in the future? Again, the, the approach that I've just shown you. And then he says, what about the well-being today? Um, and he looks at these two pillars, the pillar of people living together, the social pillar, and the economic pillar of jobs and money. And then he puts underneath those three things, looking after the degradation problem, looking after the concentrations problem, both in terms of the concentrations out of the earth crust and the concentrations of man-made substances. And what can we do about this? How can we live together? It's a dialogical process that needs to take place. We need to sustain trust, is what he first puts up. We haven't got that, we've got to work at it. Then, we've got to distribute and control power. We've got to guarantee human rights and sustain important institutions. And what else do we need to add there? It's really interesting to look at. Saving resources for the future. Using energy and materials well. Maintaining technical capital. Is it an investment or is it going to be a cost? Is the cost worth it? And what about wealth distribution? So he then does the next move, which is an elegant move of locating the sustainable development goals around that. And immediately we've got frameworks that we can begin to work on future sustainability get together with. And these tools are the tools that universities all over the world are beginning to play. Now, in my 25 years of engagement in environmental education, informing these challenges of rethinking education, I've really had the privilege of working with some of the, I think, the leading intellectuals in Africa. And they're here in our university. They're here in the science departments that we need. They're here in the small institutes that we partner with and that, that we share conversations with. And so some of the foundations we already have for the transitions that we need to make. Enabling collaboration. Can we open up and strengthen the thematic working groups on future sustainability in our academy? Can we take a more inclusive approach of deliberative engagement with wider civic interest groups where the agendas are open? How do we do this? We have to actually learn to do this, and we certainly have to get better at doing this. And it's a very tough task in the current climate. Reorientation of curriculum. It has to be inclusive, exploratory, there has to be innovation, and we need a better coordinated and more collaborative research process that can actually take place. We need to be researching ourselves, and we need to be trying out things and researching them in terms of our own university and our change here. Expansive civic engagement, we've got a very good structure for scaling community engagement. I more prefer the term civic engagement. I think that community engagement 
often comes with the connotation of that's the black and the poor that we're actually working with. You know, where civic structures, they really need a lot of concern. And of course, I'm not diminishing in any way that importance, if you look at the sustainable development goals, of people being able to meet their basic needs and dignity. And we've had the privilege of working with some groups that are engaged with this um, in, in the local community context. So giving attention to how do we mediate these expansions, how do we actually make these strategic transitions, is an important challenge for us to all take up. And if I go right back to where we started, okay, it's possible to say, okay, if we're going to be rethinking education, what are they doing in other universities? And I was at two seminars in, in Sweden last week, and one of them I, I shared a platform with Arian Walls, you might know of his work, and I thought, well, his work has got something to contribute to what we're doing, what we need to do to think about. So when he starts talking about learning to know, we can talk about sustainable literacies, we can talk about systems thinking, and the adoption of an integral view. What else do we need to add there in terms of the knowledge needed? What about learning to do? Well, learning to critique and learning to tolerate criticism would be really important. Questioning the hegemonic routines, analyzing normality, looking at disruptive transgression, and how is that necessary, and how do we do it with respect? Learning to be and learning to care, connecting with people, places, and species, passion, values, meaning making, moral um, positioning, considering ethics, Lazan, you know, you'd be glad to see that, <laughs> and boundaries and limits, and learning to make change, leadership. One of the things we prided ourselves at at Rhodes, and we can still pride ourselves in, entrepreneurship, unlocking creativity, utilizing diversity, appreciating chaos and complexity as something to build from, and the um, adaptation and resilience and empowerment and collective change. All of these have a really significant role to play and more, but it's the starting points that really count in the work that we need to be challenged to do in terms of transforming education. So, as a concluding point, African identity is latent, fluid, and emergent. And the assertion that is made um, by Kalua is that the African identity, if the African identity is to empower us, what is required is that we acknowledge, first of all, that race and history and metaphysics do not enforce an identity. That we can choose within broad limits set by ecological, political, and economic realities what it will mean to be an African in the coming years. Now, of course, there's not consensus on this. He's an American African, and he has <coughs> produced such an amazing debate because the Africans are reading his work and said, his work resonates with our experience in Africa. And in Africa, we're also struggling with modernity. So you, in the struggle that you find in this deliberation, you find this real interesting interplay between modern and Africa, between identity and the struggle to who we want to be, and the sense of how can we become through our own agency and through these activities? And how can our institutions provide the crucible for this transformation to take place. Freedom seeking, freedom seeking African scholarship is what is really central to uh, so much of the work that we need to be doing towards future sustainability. This freedom seeking work comes out of many of the current discourses. It comes out of the post-colonial discourse. It comes out of Pascal's work um, on um, the critical project um, of the real as we are experiencing in the world today. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you for listening as you have. I hope you've enjoyed some of the points that I've made and they haven't been um, too controversial. And I'd like to just conclude with some thanks. To just say thank you very much to Hela and to the colleagues in the Environmental Learning Center and to the Department of Education the collegiality that we have with the other institutes where we're starting to share interests and starting to collaborate. In particular, 
thanks to Pat for being there early on and allowing this critical project to take root and for the supervision in the work, in my intellectual work, along with Denis Nell. And thanks very much to the family. I was a bit taken aback when they all arrived as a surprise. And um, they are probably amongst some of my most fervent critiques <laughs> that I've had over the years. And also some of the greatest support. So with that, thank you all for being here. And um, we hope that you will join us we will have a little bit of marimba, and we have a little bit of food, and we can have more of a deliberative discussion. And thank you very much, Dr. Mavizella, for um, creating this opportunity for me to actually explore these ideas um, with such an erudite group. Could you please join me in thanking God? Thank you very much. Uh, let me invite all of you to join us uh, in celebrating Rob and his contribution as an outstanding professor at George University. The celebration will be across uh, at the Environmental Learning Research Center. Thank you very much. Good evening.